My talk today is just focused on Alaska's economy. And from the start, let me say I'm a diversify the economy, high technology type of guy. Companies I've start, started over my garage uh, trade on the NASDAQ, in one case in the Toronto Venture Exchange in the other. You could be using our products if you're using Google Street View or, or uh, MapQuest 360. And even if you have currency in your pocket, and I guess I picked up a little bit last night, you're carrying an, <laughs> you're carrying an anti counterfeiting uh, digital watermark we help bring to market. I know from experience the Alaskans can compete on world markets every day because we do it every day. And there are no limits to what we can do. I also chair the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, and in that job I've helped shepherd billions of dollars working very closely with Congressman Young, Senator Murkowski, Senator Stevens, uh, to basic and applied research in Alaska. And all of this is crucial to our economy, energy production, health, and reducing the awful suicide epidemic in the bush, and research helps maintain our fish and wildlife for managing for abundance. It helps bring new opportunities like transarctic shipping. And our university leads the world in Arctic research. Now, a talk about Alaska's economy could focus on all those subjects. And the fact is today and in the near future, our economy and our government is based on oil and gas. We can't quit pushing for a North Slope gas line, no matter how much gas shale has been discovered in the lower 48. We have to be positioned for world markets, the lower 49, Asia, maybe Europe. You may not know it, but Chile is now taking coal from the Isabelli mine near Fairbanks. There is no substitute for being competitive. We have to compete. Waiting for an open season reminds me of a government speed dating program or an episode of The Bachelor. At the same time, we should be playing in that old game show, Let's Make a Deal. Ask your candidate, ask your legislator, ask your favorite pipeline proposer, when will we actually see buyers, sellers, and pipelines in the same room? A gas pipeline won't happen until this happens, and I encourage this governor, any governor, to start calling the meeting. I've learned in business nothing happens without customers. And while we keep pushing to market our gas, let's remember we've gone through four governors in the last 10 years and dozens of legislative sessions where the mantra has been all gas all the time. And while every politician wants to magically draw a pipeline out of the hat, we've taken our eye off the ball with the mainstay of our economy, and that's oil. Alaska has to send a message this year. It's for Alaska jobs. It's for America's security. It's important to save our state and nation from bankruptcy, where we borrow to buy abroad more than we produce at home. The message is simple. Mr. Obama, fill up this pipeline. I hope our president knows that the Trans-Alaska Pipeline has provided as much as one-fifth of America's oil in the last generation. It was the largest private project ever built in history. It produced thousands of jobs all over the country, and it still does. But this pipeline is starting to run on empty. Let the flow slow down enough, and it becomes not a lifeline, but the world's longest chapstick. We can't let that happen. Falling oil production is dangerous for Alaska, dangerous for the country, but starting here, we can change this. Mr. Obama, fill up this pipeline. You can fill it up with oil from NPRA. Just tell your Army Corps of Engineers to work it out. They just denied a bridge across the Colville River that would bring more oil to the pipeline. Mr. Obama, you can fill up this pipeline with oil from the Outer Continental Shelf. Just tell your Secretary of the Interior and your Administrator of EPA to let us go ahead with safe exploration and just put back those leases you took off the table. And while you're at it, tell us what a new critical habitat hundreds of thousands of square miles means for polar bears and means for America's energy needs. Mr. Obama, you might even fill up this pipeline with oil from Anwar. But your U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is planning some more permanent set-asides. Now, what happened to the No More Clause, Don, in the 1980 Alaska Lands Act that th said the bureaucrats are not supposed to plan more wilderness? Here in Alaska, we have to force this issue. Let's lease the structures near Anwar that we own. Alaska has a three-mile strip adjacent to Anwar's coastal plain offshore. Let's lease it. Let's drill it. Perhaps we propose directional drilling just in the winter to confirm what's there. 
and if it pencils out, put production facilities offshore, underwater, heck, even underground like a mine. The American people deserve to know what kind of reserve is really there. We will not roll over and play dead on this issue. Mr. Obama, fill up this pipeline. When Alaskans are facing the risks of offshore drilling, we face reality and we work hard to eliminate those risks. Last week we had the world's oil spill experts in Anchorage, and we have another meeting coming up this week. And the point is, is that we learned from Exxon Valdez, no more oil spills. But that doesn't mean no more oil. It means that we face the risk solidly and we go, go forward. Some folks I've met in Washington seem to think if they shut down Alaska, they've saved the Arctic. Have they heard Norway is drilling offshore? Canada just on their side of the border? Russia on the other side of the border? Even Greenland is going ahead, and Denmark has promised them if they find enough oil, they will be a country, not a colony. Now, wouldn't it be nice if Alaska was not a colony? Alaska should stand, not stand back while others race to these resources. We should be leading, setting the example. Next week, God willing and volcanoes behaving, I'm invited by the Russian government to a meeting in Moscow with Vladimir Putin where we discuss, we'll discuss the strategic value of the Arctic to all our countries. Russia understands what America sometimes doesn't. The Arctic matters. And we who, who live here now know we must work together because if any one of us messes up, it hurts all of us. Here in Alaska, we're up against reality. We'll work together to ensure that we don't spill oil, that we don't interfere with subsistence, that air and water quality is maintained. We'll work to know the Arctic Ocean as it changes. Those are our preconditions for offshore drilling. In Washington, the story is different. Decision makers there are almost religiously anti-oil. Their vision of a carbon-free world begins by choking off supply, even if it means your job goes away and our pipeline runs empty. They'd rather buy oil overseas than produce it safely here. So it's time for a new challenge to the federal government. Challenge them to help us get to a million barrels a day. Challenge them to set with us in a national goal from their lands on the North Slope, our lands and native lands, to get that production going. Challenge them to solve the problems they find here rather than knocking us down one thing at a time like a bowling pin. Challenge them and see how they answer, and I believe the American people will be with us. You know, we're governed by people who just know so much that isn't so. They live with a myth that we don't need oil, we don't need gas, we don't need to produce. The chief policy guy at the Department of Energy wrote a book called Freedom from Oil. I say we just need freedom. With this kind of thinking in Washington, Alaska's message to America has to be, America, we've got your back. Let us stay strong and we'll keep you strong. We'll give you a reason not to send hundreds of billions of dollars overseas buying oil. We'll give you revenue to reduce the deficit. We'll give you security from secure supplies. We'll give you the keys to the Arctic, where the USGS believes that 13% of the world's oil, 30% of the world's natural gas, is yet to be found. We're not going to let government weaken our families, our hunting and fishing rights, our gun rights, our culture, our communities. Government was established to protect our liberties, not to take them away. We will not let your policy bankrupt the country or leave us defenseless. We have to be loud and clear. Alaska's weakness will speed America's weakness, and Alaska's strength can help America recover. At this convention, this weekend, we can begin to make a difference. Alaska Republicans should invite every congressional candidate in the country, uh, every Republican candidate in the country, up here and show them what we can do for America. Republicans across the land should join the chorus. Mr. Obama, fill up this pipeline. Send them a plane ticket. I'll contribute. I've talked to Randy about this. I'll contribute, and I ask you to as well. We'll pass the purse like we did last night. Alaska's stalemate on energy production has got to end. Remember what the last generation of Alaskans did during the D2 battle, the battle for native land claims, the battle for the pipeline, the battle for statehood. They got up to fight. Well, now it's our time. Let's roll. I just can't believe that we're going to let a stalemate happen and put us out of business, put our jobs. Alaska has to know the world in which we compete. We have to build and keep our advantage in the oil patch, 
in global transportation, in fishing, in defending the country, in tourism. We will do that with a party of limited government, but a people of unlimited dreams and aspirations. We will do that by calling on the country to let us produce and serving that country, serving the world with what we can do in producing and protecting the environment. So before I go, let me just say it one more time. Mr. Obama, fill up this pipeline. Thank you, and I hope to see you at our home on May 7th to protect our families and our children. Thank you.